and also there will be no flash photography whatsoever, or else we're going to have to go. <laughs> Sorry, it's just the way it's going to go. Sorry, honey, got to go. Yeah. Anyway, so. um, uh, enjoy the show. Um, these actors work really hard on it. It's a really good show, so enjoy. Quite all right. You're not disturbing me. I would much rather talk than work, but here I am day after day haunted by one thought. I must write. I must write. I must write. This is my study, the room in which I write my stories. I built it myself, actually. Cut the timber and fitted the logs. Made an awful mess of it. I do my writing here at the side of the room because the roof leads directly over the desk, and I'd move the desk, but it covers the hole I left in the floor. And the floor was built on the side of the hill, so in heavy rains, the room tends to slide downhill. Many's the day I've stood in this cabin and passed my neighbors standing in the road. Still, I'm happy here, although I don't get enough visitors to suit me. Uh, people tend to shy away from writers. They assume we're always busy thinking. Not true. Why, even my dear sweet mother doesn't like to disturb me, so she always tiptoes up here and leaves my food outside the door. I haven't had a hot meal in years, but I've done a good deal of writing, perhaps too much. I look out the window and think that life is passing me at a furious rate. So I ask myself the question, what force is it that compels me to write so incessantly, day after day, page after page, story after story? And the answer is quite simple. I am a writer. Sometimes I think I may be mad. Oh, I'm quite harmless, I assure you. But I do admit to fits of wandering. I'm engaged in conversations where I hear nothing and see only the silent movement of lips and answer a meaningless, yes, yes, of course. And all the time I'm thinking, it'll make a wonderful character for a story, this one. Uh, still, I enjoy writing, and I like reading the proofs, but as soon as it appears in print, I can't bear it. I see that it's all wrong, a mistake, that it ought never to have been written, and I am miserable. Then the public reads it. Yes, charming, clever. Charming, but a far cry from Tolstoy. Or a fine thing, but Turgenev's Fathers and Sons is better. It be this way to my dying day. Charming and clever. Charming and clever. Nothing more. And when I die, my friends will walk by my grave and say, here lies so-and-so, a good writer, but Turgenev was better. <laughs> it's funny, but before you came in tonight, I was thinking to myself, perhaps I should give it up one day. What would I do instead? Well, I've never freely admitted this before, but to you here in the theater tonight, I would like to tell you what I would most like to do with my life. Ever since I was a small child, I always... I always, excuse me a moment, <laughs> an idea just occurred to me, a subject for a short story. Hmm. Yes, yes, what was it we were talking about? Hmm. Never mind, my thoughts are consumed with this new story. See if this appeals to you. It starts in a theater. It starts on the opening night of the new season. It starts with the arrival of all those dear and devoted patrons of the arts who wave and greet each other in the Grand Salon, commenting on how this one looks and how that one is dressed, scarcely knowing which play they're about to see that evening with the exception of one man, Ivan Ilyich Cherjakov. 
A civil servant, a clerk in the Ministry of Public Parks, had any passion in life at all, it was the theater. He certainly had hopes and ambitions for higher office, and had dedicated his life to hard work, zeal, and patience. But still, he would not deny himself his one great pleasure. And so it was that he had purchased two tickets for the very best section of the theater on opening night of Rostov's The Bearded Countess. As fortune would have it, into the theater that night came his respected superior, General Mikhail Brasilov, the Minister of Public Parks himself. Good evening, General. Yes, good evening. <laughs> oh, permit me, sir. Oh, I am Tverdyakov. Ivan Ilyich? This is a great honor for me, sir. Yes. Oh. Like you, sir, I too serve in the Ministry of Public Parks. I am Assistant Chief Head Clerk in the Department of Trees and Bushes. Yes, lovely uh, trees and bushes this year. Very nice. Oh. Uh, General Brasselhoff, my wife would very much like to say hello. How do you do? My pleasure. My pleasure, General. How do you do? <laughs> My wife. How do you do, Madam Brazelhoff? How do you do? Uh, I just had the pleasure of meeting your husband. And I am my wife's husband. How do you do, Madam Brazelhoff? Shh. Sorry. Terribly sorry. I hope you enjoy the play, sir. I will if I can watch it. Feeling quite satisfied with himself for having made the most of this golden opportunity, Ivan Ilyich Chejekov sat back to enjoy the bearded countess. He was no longer a stranger to the Minister of Public Parks. They had become, if one wanted to be quite familiar about the matter, known to one another. And then suddenly, like a bolt from a gray, thundering sky, Ivan Ilyich Chejekov reared back his head and... <laughs> in his mind until it resembled the angry roar of a cannon aimed squarely at enemy camp. He slowed down the procedure, viewing it again so he could watch again in horror the infamous deed. Looks like rain. I don't want to get my head wet again. 
You shouldn't let people sneeze on you, dear. You're not to be sneezed at. <laughs> oh, I'm ruined. I'm ruined. They'll be fired from trees and bushes and sent down the branches and twigs. Come on, Ben. <laughs> what? You mustn't let it concern you. It was a harmless little sneeze. The general's probably forgotten it already. Do you really think so? No, I'm scared, Ivan. <laughs> <laughs> and so they walked home in despair. Maybe if I send them a nice gift or something. Maybe some Turkish towels. Chejakov's once promising career had literally been blown away. <laughs> <laughs> Why did this happen to me? Why did we go to the theater at all? Why didn't we sit in the balcony as people of own class? You know they love sneezing on each other. <laughs> Come to bed, Ivan. Perhaps if I call him here in the morning and explain myself in a honest, self-effacing manner, he'll have no choice but to forgive me. Maybe it's best if you didn't remind him of it. No, no, no. If I ever expect to become a gentleman, I must behave like one. It just so happened that the next day was the morning that the general listened to petitions. And so Cherjakov came and waited until late, late, late afternoon. Next! <laughs> I'm not next, sir. I'm last. Very well, then. Last! Well, that would be <laughs> well, what is your petition? I have no petition, so I'm not the petitioner. Oh, then you waste my time. Do you not recognize me, sir? It is I, the splatterer. For what? Sneezer, the sneezing splatterer. <laughs> and what is it you want now, Gazootite? <laughs> no, Your Excellency, your forgiveness. I just wanted to point out that there was no political or antisocial motivation behind the sneeze. It was a non-partisan, non-violent act of God. I cursed the day of protuberance forms itself on my face, but I am not responsible for its indiscretions. Exile my nose, sir, but forgive me. I'm not angry with your nose. Too much else to worry about than care about your nasal problems. Look, I suggest two things. Go home. Take a hot bath. Take a cold bath. Take something. Just leave me be and don't come around here talking this rubbish ever again. Jibba, jibba, jibba. That's all I've heard all day. Jibba, 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 jibba. Thank you, sir. God bless you and your wife. And your household too. May your days be sweet and your nights be better than your days. The feeling of relief was enormous. May the birds sing at your window in the morning. <laughs> May the coffee in your cup be strong and hot. The weight of the burden that had been lifted was inestimable. I worship the chair that you sit upon and the uniform that you wear that sits on the chair that I worship. He walked home, <laughs> singing and whistling like a lark. <laughs> oh God, I'm happy! And yet... <laughs> and yet... When he arrived home, he began to think... Have I been the butt of a cruel and thoughtless Jew? Had the minister toyed with him? If he had no intention of punishing me, then why does he torment me so unmercifully? If the sneeze meant so little to the general, then why did he deliberately cause Chechekov to ride in his bed? To twist in agony throughout the night! Chechekov was furious! I am furious! He paced and fumed the entire night, and when he awoke, he called out for his wife, Sonia! Sonia! <laughs> I have been humiliated. You, Ivan? Who would humiliate you? You're such a kind and generous person. Who? I'll tell you who. General Brasenhoff himself. What did he do? This swine. He practically forced me to come up to his office and groveling <laughs> beg like an idiot. I was reduced to a gibbering fool. You were that reduced? I must call on him in the morning. Tell him how I feel. People of all nations, regardless of color and creed, should be free to sneeze upon the superiors. Whatever they like. <laughs> it is he. 
We will be humiliated by I. And so, Chejek all went to humiliate he. Last! Well, what is it? What is it? Do you not recognize me, sir? Look at my face! Yes, it is I once again. It is you once again who? Turn the car! The spatterer! The what? The spatterer! Well, what is it? What is it? What is it, you ask? You sit there behind your desk in your lofty position as General Minister of Public Park, and you ask me, a lowly servant, what is it? You sit there with full knowledge that in this world there are those that obey, and those that are obey, those that bow, and those that are bowed to, those that serve, and those that are served. And still, you ask me, what is it? <laughs> what is it? Don't stand there shivering like an idiot. Ah! Look what you made me do! Sorry, what is it? <laughs> I'll tell you what it is! I just wanted to apologize. I wasn't sure I made it clear the other day. <laughs> <laughs> if you ever cross my line of vision again, I'll have you exiled forever. What's your name? Say <laughs> <Figure>, oh! <laughs> Mother of a ringworm! <laughs> you were nothing, do you hear me? Nothing! <laughs> At that moment, something broke loose deep inside of Cherjakov. The matter was over, finally and forever. It seemed that it was so vital, so organic, that it was the very force of life itself. What happened next was very simple. Ivan Ilyich Chejakov went home, took off his coat, lay down on his couch, and died. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. For those of you who are offended by life's cruelty, there is an alternate ending. Ivan Ilyich Chejakov went home, took off his coat, and inherited five million rubles. <laughs> I know there's not really a point to it, but hey, it's uplifting. It's not my intention to paint life any harsher than it really is, but some people are indeed trapped. Witness the predicament of a young governess who cares for and educates the children of a well-to-do family. <laughs> Julia! Trapped indeed. <laughs> Julia! Pick your head up, girl. I'd like to see your eyes when I speak to you. Yes, sir. How are the children coming along with their French lessons? They're very bright children, sir. Very bright, you say? Well, why not? And mathematics? They're doing well in mathematics, I assume. Yes, sir. Especially Vanya. I knew it. I excelled in mathematics. Now then, let's settle our accounts. I imagine you must need money, although you never ask me for it yourself. We agreed on 30 rubles a month, did we not? 40, sir. No, no, 30. I always pay my governesses 30. Who told you 40? You did, sir. I spoke to no one else concerning money. Perhaps you heard 40 when in fact I said 30. That wouldn't happen if you kept your head up, Julia. <laughs> yes, sir. Now then, you've been here two months, correct? Two months and five days. No, no, I have here exactly two months. We should keep books the way I do. That way we wouldn't have these little discrepancies. Yes, sir. Now, two months at 30 rubles a month is 60 rubles, correct? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Subtract nine Sundays. We did agree to subtract Sundays, didn't we? No, sir. Well, of course we did, Julia. Don't you remember in our first meeting I said that we'd subtract Sundays? Yes, sir. Eyes, <laughs> eyes, girl. Now then, and three holidays. 
Two, sir. Christmas and New Year's. And your birthday, that's three. But I worked on my birthday, sir. You did? Well, there was no need to. My governesses never work on their birthdays. <laughs> but I did work, sir. That's not the question, Julia. We're discussing financial matters now. However, I will only count two holidays if you insist. Do you insist? I did work, sir. Then you do insist. No, sir. Very well, then. Three holidays. <laughs> now then, four days Mr. Collier was sick, and there were no lessons. But I gave lessons to Vanya. Julia, I engaged you to teach two children, did I not? Should I pay you in full for only doing half the work? No, sir. So we'll deduct it. Three days, you had a toothache, and my wife gave you permission not to work after lunch. After four. I worked until four. Julia, we have lunch at one and are finished by two, correct? Yes, sir. Hmm. Now then, on January 9th, you broke a teacup and saucer. Just the saucer, sir. The kids were throwing them around the dining room, and I couldn't catch the one saucer. Hmm. Julia, what good is a teacup without a saucer? <laughs> Two rubles. It was a family heirloom and worth much more, but I'm used to taking losses. Thank you, sir. Now then, on January 19th, Collier was climbing a tree and tore his jacket. I forbid him to do so, but he kicked me in the shin and ran right up the tree. But he didn't listen, Julia. <laughs> Ten rubles. <laughs> now then. On January 14th, little Vanya's shoes were stolen. <laughs> By the maid, you discharged her yourself. But I pay you good money to watch everything, Julia. Don't you remember in our first meeting when we discussed this? Were you listening that day or was your head in the clouds? Yes, sir. Yes, your head was in the clouds. No, sir, I was listening. What? I was listening, sir. Mm. Now then, it says here on January 14th, I gave you 10 rubles. No, sir. Well, I have a note of it in my book. Why would I make a note of it if, in fact, I did not give you ten rubles? I don't know, sir. That's not a good excuse, Julia. Deduct it. <laughs> Subtract all of that, and we're left with fourteen rubles, correct? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Oh, tears? Oh, Julia, what's wrong? <laughs> you tell me, I'm so sensitive to tears. <laughs> Only once since I've been here have I received any money, and that was by your wife. On my birthday, she gave me three rubles. She did. Well, she didn't tell me about it. We'll have to deduct that as well. <laughs> Sorry, sometimes I'm a little lax with my figures, always shortchanging myself. Now then, 14 subtract 3, we're left with 11 rubles, correct? Yes, sir. Would you like to check my figures? No, sir, it's not necessary. Here we are. Your salary for two months. 11 rubles. Count it. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, Seven, eight, nine, ten. There's only ten, sir. Are you sure? Yes, sir. Well, it's not on the desk. Perhaps you dropped one on the floor. Look around, girl. Look around. <laughs> oh, come on the desk. It's a family heirloom. I'm sorry, sir. Where did you find it? No, sir. Ten will do just fine. Thank you, sir. Now then, we'll keep looking for it on the floor, and if you don't see it, we'll discuss it next month. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Julia! <laughs> yes, sir. Why did you thank me here? For the money, sir. But don't you realize what I've done? I've cheated you. Instead of 80 rubles, which I owe, owe you, I've only paid you 10. Here you go, girl. I'm going to give you the full amount. As you wish, sir. Thank you, sir. Julia! Is it possible to be such a... a simpleton? Yes, sir. It's possible. <laughs> <laughs> Pain can be a funny thing, especially when you're not the one in pain. Observe. Oh my gosh. Oh. Ah! Greetings, sir.
sir. What brings you here? The pain is unbearable. It is beyond unbearable. It is unendurable. Where exactly is the pain? Where is it? It's not just the two. It's the whole side of my mouth. How long have you had this pain, sir? Ten years. Ten years? Since yesterday morning, it seems like ten years. I must have said terribly to deserve this. God must have dropped all other business to punish me this way. Where's the doctor? The doctor is away on family business, but he left the care of his patients in my own capable hands. Well, are you a doctor? In every way except a degree. I'm a doctor to be. Oh, oh then I'm a patient to be. Goodbye. Wait, wait. Wait, wait, I assure you, sir, the only thing preventing me from being called a doctor is the familiarity of an examination. I'm still, I'm just not trained. I thank you, please, for this opportunity. Father? Oh, oh. Heaven help me to die. Oh, even sitting hurts. No doubt the nerves are inflamed. Once removed, the problem will cease to exist. Well, you're going to remove the nerves? Well, the tooth connected to the nerves. It's a simple matter oh. of surgery. Oh. oh, I pray for you. I pray to the saints and to our dear Lord in heaven. Be gentle with me. Spare me pain. OK, I'm just going to have a look, OK? OK. Oh. okay. Oh. Okay. Open your mouth. No. Open your mouth. <laughs> My dear Sexton, in order for me to enjoy, I know as inexperienced as I am, I have to look at your teeth in order to examine them. Now please, open your mouth. Okay. <laughs> I want to examine your teeth, not brush them. Now open your mouth. Okay. <laughs> oh, you're a nasty little one, aren't you? Oh. Stop talking to it. Don't make friends with it. Pull it out. Don't crush me! <laughs> okay. I'm merely examining you, okay? All right. Oh, God. Oh. God, it's even disgusting to look at. <laughs> what is it? There's a hole big enough in your tooth to drive a horse and carriage through. Okay? Now, I'm going to try something. I'm going to blow on the tooth to see how exposed the nerve is, okay? <laughs> okay. Oh! Oh! I have some information for you, Father. The nerve is exposed. <laughs> is that how far science is advanced? Blow it on me! Yes, but so much is still inconclusive. So much depends on the temperature of the doctor's breath. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what are you gonna do with that? <laughs> the tune has to be pulled. Now, whatever you do, do not twitch, or I will break the crown. It'll just, you know. <laughs> oh, merciful God! I pray for you. Are you? I, I pray for you. I pray. May the Lord light your soul. May he give you health and quickness. Mostly quickness. Okay. Here we go. Ready? No. Mm -mm. Uh. Let go of my hand! Let go of my hand! Let go! You ready? Okay. Oh. Got my hand again! Let go of my hand! If you don't let go of my hand, I'm gonna pull your fingers out with these forceps! Harder than the room. 
roots in your mouth or the brains in your head! You butcher. You carpenter. Your God's vengeance for my sins. Compared to you, the toothache was a joy. Oh! <laughs> Get back here! <laughs> Keep away from me, sorcerer. Put those fingers in my mouth. It'll be the first all food I eat all week. You're not going anywhere until those roots come out! Well, hmm? Yeah! Oh! Back up! <laughs> I give up. I failed my duty. Come, my son. Let us pray for a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Lord in heaven, our God above, I plead for this good doctor. <laughs> I pray for this poor creature. Keep his hand steady. Keep his mouth open. Don't let him falter. Don't let him bite me. Hail Mary! Hail Mary! Hail Mary! Hail Mary! Hail Mary! Patricia Semyonik was the greatest seducer of other women's husbands I have ever met. She was successful with all men for that matter. But there was a special challenge to handsome men married to prominent gorgeous young women. I could never do her justice. Let her tell you in her own words. If I may say so myself, I am the greatest seducer of other women's husbands that I have ever met. I say this not boastfully, but as a matter of record. The staggering figures speak for themselves. For those women interested in playing this highly satisfying but often dangerous game, I urge you to get out pen, paper, and to take notes. I'm going to explain my methods. Indeed, married men may do likewise, but it will do them little good if they happen to be the chosen victim. Uh -huh. Nothing has never failed. Now then, there are three vital characteristics needed. They are patience, more patience, and still, more patience. Those who do not have the strength to wait and persist, uh, I urge you to take up bicycling, rowing perhaps. Seducing isn't for you. Now then, in order to seduce another woman's husband, you must I repeat, must stay as far away from him as possible. Pay him no attention at all. Ignore him even. We will get to him through the wife. You are about to witness a practical example. For as it happens, I am madly and deeply in love this week. My heart pounds with excitement at the very thought that he will be walking through this garden in a few moments with his wife. Every fiber of my being tells me to throw my arms around him and embrace him with all the passion in my heart. Uh, but observe how a master works. I shall be cool, almost to the point of freezing. My heart of hearts and a spouse of roses. Suppose glorious. You suppose correct? 
Any complications? As usual, a wife. I'm afraid my cause looks out this. Oh, nonsense, Patricia. I'm placing my money on you, and you know I never bet unless I'm sure of winning. Well, we're off. Happy hunting, my gal. Happy hunting. Sir? Beautifully done, don't you think? I am sometimes awed by the work of a true professional. Did you notice that our eyes barely met, that we hardly spoke a word to each other, and what he already knows of me is that A, I'm a popular bachelorette, B, I'm a woman in love, always tilling to romantic men, C, I'm an excellent chef, a nice contrast to his wife, and D, and this is most important, I'm a dangerous woman with the men. <laughs> <laughs> Quite frankly, right now, he's disgusted with me. A, because I'm unmarried. B, because I'm shameless about my intentions. And C, he doesn't know that he's the one I'm interested in. Uh, forgive me if I'm overcome by my own deviousness. It, are you getting all this down? It's a bit tricky from here on in. Now then, the next step, hypnosis. Not hypnosis of the eyes, but poison of the tongue like a venomous snake going in for the kill. <laughs> Watch how I accidentally run into the wife one day at the club. <coughs> Patricia, you're a looking clown. I take it your pursuit isn't going well? Isn't it obvious, Nikki? Doomed. I haven't seen him since last I saw you and your dear husband. Oh, Nikki, Nikki. Why do I waste my youth chasing after men? I can never really call my own. How oh, I envy you. Me? What is it that you envy about me? By your marriage, of course. <laughs> Charming man your husband is. Let me tell you. Really? What is it that fascinates you so about him? His grace, his quiet charm, everything. But mostly the way he looks at you, Nikki, with such loving, adoring eyes. It must send quivers through your whole body. Quivers? No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> tingle, perhaps? Don't tell me you don't tingle when he looks at you. Of, of course, I, I tingle all the time. <laughs> <laughs> An ideal man your husband is. Take that from a lonely bachelorette. I'd be glad to think you knew a husband like that. Perhaps fate will be as kind to you. I'm counting on. Good heavens, I'm late for a doctor's appointment. Uh, what's he treating you for? Uh, melancholia. Uh, please say hello to your extraordinary husband for me, uh, but I urge you not to mention our conversation. It might embarrass his fragile ego. Where, where is the man for me? Uh, I know where he is, uh, but the question is, how soon will he be mine? Uh, <laughs> There's still work to be done, but not by me. That task falls to my aide and accomplice, his wife. Oh, by the way, I saw Patricia Simeonich today. say would interest me. She spoke most enthusiastically about you. It was something about your grace and your quiet charm. She felt that you were capable of loving a woman in some extraordinary way. It was something about your eyes, the way you look so adoringly. Well, she went on and on. Well, good night. Good night. What else? <laughs> what else did she have to say about me? <laughs> Whatever that little no, 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 some woman's name is. What else did Patricia have to say about me? That's more or less of it what I told you. But you said she went on and on! She did. But if she went on and on, don't stop! Either go on and on or let's go to bed. She wanted someone to look at her the way that you looked at me. It's how does she know how I look at you? I guess the day in the garden, she must have been looking at you while you were looking at me. 
Oh my God, the power went out. Honey, hold me. Honey. Honey, I'm scared. I'm scared of the dark. Oh, okay. Oh. Good color. How does she know how I look at you? Just like I was saying, that day in the garden, she must have been looking at you when you were looking at me. Made you tingle? Exactly, my precious. Oh, wait a second! You were looking at her, so you couldn't have been looking at me. And I was looking at the flowers. Because she made me nervous the way she kept avoiding looking at me. You must have tingled for some other reason. Well, it's getting rather confusing. The fact is, she found you fascinating, and I thought it would please you. Well, it doesn't. I'd rather you not discuss me with her anymore. Do you plan on seeing her again? Yes, tomorrow for lunch. Well, tomorrow at lunch, tell her what I told you, and then at dinner tomorrow you tell me what she said, okay? <laughs> Let's go to bed. <laughs> I love you, honey. Good night, my love. I am spellbound by my own powers. I not only succeeded in piquing his interest, but causing his heart to flutter at the mention of my name. The same man who called me loathsome not two minutes ago. Oh, luncheon the next day was not only nourishing, but productive. By the way, old girl, I ran into Neversaw the other day, a Russian artist. It seems he's been commissioned by some wealthy prince to paint the head of a Russian nobleman. He asked me if I knew of any models for him, and I said I did, but I didn't dare ask him myself. But what do you think of asking your husband? Asking my husband what? To model, of course. That handsome face of his, it would be a damn shame for that exquisite face to miss the chance to be immortalized for all the world. Really? For all the world? Hmm. Why don't you discuss it with him? Good idea. I'll discuss it with him. I think it's nonsense. Those exact words, a typical Russian nobleman. And that it would be a damn shame for that exquisite face to miss the chance to be immortalized for all the world. And that it would be a damn shame if you missed that chance. Well, I think it's nonsense. What else did she say? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> that you were very interesting, and, and that handsome face. She said that a number of times. Once, twice? How many? Uh, I can't remember. Let me think. It's okay. I just wish you would write these things down from now on. <laughs> Do you like? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Did you invite her to dinner tomorrow night? She's busy. Oh, well, the day after that? Busy. And next week, next month? Doesn't the woman eat? Well, she says she's involved on a very important case, and that'll be months before she can see us again. But she did say that with patience and persistence, good things will come up to her. By the way, she thinks you should go on the stage. Really? 
<laughs> me on the stage. Oh, in heaven's name. Oh, wait just a minute. I don't want to misquote her. Take your time. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. With such an attractive appearance and gentle nature, it's a damn shame for him to be just a fashion designer. And that natures like that do not exist by time and space. Oh, God, she said that. And then she went on to say, if I weren't so busy, I'd take him away from you. <gasps> I don't think I want to hear anymore. What'd you say then? <laughs> I said, well, take him then. I'm not going to oh. fight over him. <laughs> Nikki! Never talk about me with forever again. But I'm just <laughs> my love. She's the one that brings you up all the time. She yelled at me. He's an exceptional creature, strong, seeking a way out. She said, I didn't understand you. And she said, if I were Turgenev, I would put him in a novel. The passionate angel, I would call it. The woman is weird. Definitely weird. Well, let's go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> She's delivering my love letters, sealing them with kisses, and calls me where? I ask you. So, let's go over what we know so far. The poor man is obviously consumed with a passion to meet me. He is convinced that I am the only woman who truly understands him. His yawning, disinterested wife transmits my remarks, but it is my voice he hears, my words which sing in his heart. I am relentless. There is no room for mercy in the seducing business. Observe how deftly the final stroke is applied. Oh, for the fainted heart, I urge you, look away. Nikki, I don't want to hear anymore. But I don't bring you up, my love. She said that because of your sweet, sympathetic nature, you would be upset to hear of someone in distress. She's in distress? She's worse. She's gloomy, morbid, more in steps of despair. But well, doesn't she know how much I, we, we, care about her? Doesn't she know how much I, we, we, long to be with her? Doesn't she know how much I, we, we, long to be in her arms, her grasp? You and I, Well, I again urged her to come over to dinner, but she said that she can't face people, and she doesn't go home, and so she won't see her the gardens between eight and nine every night. <laughs> oh, by the way, we're um, invited to the fashion house for dinner tomorrow night. Will you be able to attend? No. Aunt Sophia is sick. I must go see her. I'll be home by nine. Or a little after. <laughs> anyway, good night. <laughs> No applause. I couldn't have done it alone. I shared that honor with my good friend and collaborator, his wife. She wooed him so successfully that there is no carriage fast enough for him to be in my arms. He ran all the way. Observe. Oh, uh, now you will understand if I ask you to busy yourselves with your programs or such. Uh, these next few moments are private, and I am, after all, a lady. My love, how I've longed! Not a word, not a sound. Not until you've heard what's in my heart. For weeks now you used my wife as a clever and devious device to arouse my passions. Which I freely admit have been lying dormant these past seven years. <laughs> She's not a sensual woman, nor even remotely romantic. Our relationship neither reaches the heights of ecstasy, nor the depths of despair. It's an even marriage. You have two choices now. You can take me in your arms, and my marriage with Nikki will be crumbled forever. Or number two, you can turn your back and I will not look or speak at you again. The choice is yours and yours alone. Choose wisely. For my heart is near heavens. <laughs> 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 
God bless you, Patricia, said my fucking bitch. May God make you as happy as you have just made me. Patricia Semyonik, from that day forward, turned her attentions to single, unmarried men only. Until one day, the perfect boy came along and the confirmed bachelorette finally married at last. She is today a completely happy woman. Except possibly on those occasions when some dashing young woman tells her how attractive she finds her lovely young husband. <laughs> Next actress, please. Next actress, please. <clears throat> name? What? Your name? Oh, Nina. Nina? Is that it? Just Nina? Yes, ma'am. Uh, no, ma'am. Nina Mikhailovna Zemeknaya. Age. My age? Yes, that means how old are you? <laughs> how old are you looking for? Couldn't you answer the question simply, please? Yes, ma'am. I just wanted you to know. I can be any age you want me to. 16 and 30. In school, I played a 78-year-old woman with rheumatism, and everybody said it was very believable. A 79-year-old romantic woman told me so herself. Yes, but we're not looking for a 78-year-old romantic woman. We're looking for a 22-year-old girl. Now, how old are you? 22, ma'am. <laughs> really? I would have guessed 27 or 28. I have a bad head cold, sir. It makes me look older. Last year I had influenza. The doctor thought I was 39. I promise I can look 22 when you need me to, sir. Do you have a temperature? Yes, ma'am. 103. Good, Good God! God! Now go home, child! Go to bed! You can come back some other time. But I waited six months for this audition. Not counting the three months I waited to get on the six-month waiting list. If they put me on the end of that list again, I'll be 23 by then, and it'll be too late to be 22. Please let me read. I'm really feeling much better now. I think I'm down to 101. I can see you have your heart set on being an actress. My heart, my soul, my very breath, the bones in my body, the blood in my veins. Yes, yes, we've had enough of your medical history. But what practical experience have you had? As what? Well, for example, the thing we're discussing, acting. How much acting experience have you had? You mean on a stage? That's as good a place as any. I studied for three years on a Madame Zoblianska. She teaches here in Moscow? No, in my high school, in Odessa. But she was a very great actress herself. Here in Moscow? No, in Odessa. You are then, strictly speaking, an amateur. <laughs> yes, sir, in Moscow. In Odessa, I'm a professional. Yes, but you see, we're looking for a 22-year-old actress who is a professional in Moscow. Odessa, I grant you, is a lovely city, but uh, theatrically speaking, is no Moscow. I would advise you to get more experience and take some aspirins. <laughs> <laughs> I've traveled four days just to get here. Couldn't you just let me read? My dear child, I find this very embarrassing. Even if you did not employ me, just to read for you would be a memory I would cherish for all of my life. If I may be so bold, sir, I think you're one of the greatest living authors in all of Russia. Really? That's very kind of you. Perhaps we do have a few minutes. I've read almost everything you've written. The articles, the stories. <laughs> I love the one of... <laughs> <laughs>
The death of a government. I don't recall that one. What was that about? Chargicon? The sneezer? <laughs> the sneezing splatterer? <laughs> really? You found that funny, did you? <laughs> Strange. I meant that to be sad. <laughs> oh, oh, it was sad. It was tragically funny. I cried for days. <laughs> oh, was it really? And of everything you've read, what was your favorite? My very favorite? Yes, what was it? Tolstoy's War and Peace. You asked what my favorite was. Well, you're an honest little thing, aren't you? It's irritating, but refreshing. Very well. What are you going to read for us? I should like to read from the three sisters. Indeed. Which sister? All of them, if you have the time. Uh, all of them? Good God! Why don't you read the entire play while you're at it? Oh, thank you, sir. I know it all. Act One, a drawing room at the Prosterov's house. It is midday, and a bright sun is trying to fill the large French doors. That's not necessary! An excerpt will do nicely. Thank you. Very well. Mm. I should like to read from the last moments of the play. Good, good. Uh, this shouldn't take too long. Oh, uh, whenever you're ready. I've been ready for six months, sir. Please begin. Yes, sir. Oh, sir, could you please say, ta ra ra boom die, sit on the curb I may? Certainly not. Why would I say such an idiotic thing? I don't know, ma'am. You wrote it. Chibitkin says it at the end of the play. It would help me greatly if you would just say that one line. I walked all the way from Odessa. All right, all right. Very well, then. Ready? I've been ready for six months, ma'am. Mm. Ta ra ra boom da, sit on the curb I may. And Masha says, Oh, listen to that music. They are leaving us. One is gone for good, forever. We are left alone to begin our life over again. We must live. We must live. And Irina says, A time will come we will know what all this is for, why there is all this suffering, and there will be no more mysteries. But until then, we must work, only work. Tomorrow I shall go alone, and I shall teach in the school, and give my whole life to those who need it. Now it is autumn. Soon winter will come, cover all of this in snow, and we must go on working, working. Shall I finish? Please do. And Olga says, the music plays so gaily, so violently. One wants to live. Oh my God, time will pass, and we will be forgotten. Our faces will be forgotten, our voices, and how many there were of us. But our suffers will turn into joy for those who come after us. They will bless kindly those who are living now. Oh, my dear sisters, seems if just a little more we shall know why we live, why we suffer. If only we knew. If only we knew. Thank you, sir. You made me very happy. That's all I wanted, sir. God bless you, sir. Will someone go get her before she walks all the way back to Odessa? <laughs> <laughs> okay. A woman needs only four animals in her life. A mink on her back, a jaguar in the garage, a tiger in her tank, and an ass to pay for it on. The night air is so invigorating. It vitalizes my entire body. But still I am plagued. I have the urge to write, but nothing's coming. Normally things come like a cascading fountain, but no, 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 not tonight. Still I have the urge to write. Something will come. Never fear always does. This happens to men in my profession. Writer's block, we call it. It's just temporary. Of course, it's beginning to be a very, very, very long temporary. That's okay. I know what I need. I must get home and get to sleep. God, help me! No, 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 I take that back. I shouldn't rely on collaborations of the Almighty. How selfish to ask God to take time out to help me. 
But of course, if anything, you know, does occur to you over the night, I would like if you make it known to me. Even if it is just a germ of an idea. It doesn't have to be original. I'm very good at twisting things around. God, look what I've done. Asking God to resort to plagiarism for my petty needs. I, I must get home before this gets any worse. Okay. <laughs> you, sir. Yes, I can't see you over there in the light. I was wondering if you, like, were, like, in a bit of a mood for a bit of a entertainment this evening? I'm Ooh. sure I don't know what you're talking about. I'll show you, sir. Oh, no. Amusement. Little diversion. Do you know what I mean? I think I do know what you mean, and I'm not interested. <laughs> you should know better than make such a proposition to a high moral character. Are you sure, sir? This is something like you've never, ever seen. <laughs> not even the least bit curious. Now, uh, curiosity is the nature of my profession, but I try to keep it morally elevated. Perhaps you're right, sir. This is probably too much for a man of your sensitivities. Wait! Got you with that last one, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just asking, mind you. But, uh, what exactly is this entertainment you have in mind? <laughs> well, sir, how would you like to see a drowned man? <laughs> <laughs> a what? A drowned man. A man with his lungs filled to the brim with salt water. Stoned in from drowning. How much would you pay to see that? Pay! Pay to see a drowned man? I wouldn't look at the drowned man if you paid me. Who wants to look at a drowned man? Who wants to look at a man who's drowned? You are a lunatic! <laughs> Three rubles, sir. Three rubles to see the man be for the drowning, then during the agonizing act, oh, help me, and then drown, rest his soul. Uh, so wait a second. You're saying the man isn't drowned yet. He's alive and well. Not only alive and well, but dry as a bone and before you. I am the drowned man. <laughs> you, you expect to charge me for your own suicide. You are <laughs> crazy. Kind sir, let me explain. I don't really drown. I impersonate a drowned man. I jump in the icy cold water, flare my arms around a bit, go under, come up all puppy like. <laughs> Three rubles by individuals, special rates for group show starts in two minutes. Why do I stand here listening to this? Mm -hmm. You're insane. <laughs> Sir, this is not some cheap thrill. This is a rich tableau filled with social implications. A drama, not tragic, but ironical in view of its comic features. Comic? Uh, what's comic about it? Well, sir, I blow up my cheeks. <laughs> and I bolt out my eyes. <laughs> and I make a cute little oink oink sound when I'm going under. Oink oink. <laughs> I don't want to listen to an underwater pig squeal. <laughs> I've just had a very successful season, sir. Sold out in August. Shall I book you for the dinner show? There's a dinner show? <laughs> yes, I am going to throw you a nice fish. I think the halibuts are running. Yes. <laughs> Ew! <laughs> You're a freak! <laughs> sir, I really wish you would make up your mind soon because in five minutes, that restaurant goes their garbage into the water and I have my pride. To hell with your pride! That doesn't prevent you from being an, an underwater deceased swimmer, whatever. You know how they demand vulnerable. <coughs> that was cruel. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be cruel. Look here. Did you ever see a coal mine after work? Soot and grime all over his body. Nasty. Or Barber. Come home with hair on his hands. He gets into his, his bread, his soup. Do you know where a surgeon puts his hands? Oh, God! 
Oh, I, on the other hand, I deal with water. Water is clean. It's pure. It's wet. And when I come home, I don't even have to take a bath. Can you say the same, sir? I'm not going to discuss my toilet habits with you. There must be a cabbie around here somewhere. Cabby! Yes, you. Yes. One day you're gonna come back to the docks looking for a good drowning and I'm gonna be gone. <laughs> Next week I'm in Yalta. <laughs> Get out of here! Leave me alone or I'll call a policeman. I'm going. You! Yes, you, policeman! Drowning business isn't what it used to be. Out of here! <laughs> okay. Um, yes, yes. There's a man right there. His foot. A lot of bad characters on these docks tonight, sir. Gentlemen like you shouldn't be wandering around here by yourself. What was he pestering you about? You're gonna find this a little bit strange. He was gonna try and charge me three ruples to watch him drown. Strange. Why, it's outright thievery. Uh, uh, I wouldn't pay more than 60 kopecks for a good drowning. You can get as fine a drowning as you want and not pay for any more. You seem to miss the point. That's... Why, there's two brothers on the next pier. For one ruble each, they'll give you a double drowning. You <laughs> <laughs> have to know how to bargain with these men. Look, it's not a question of price. I... Oh. Why, just the other day, ten men acted out an entire ship going down. And on a good day, you can get a whole navy going down for ten uh, rubles. <laughs> Stick to your price, sir. Have a good evening. <laughs> oh, God. It's come. It's finally come. The day the world's gone mad has arrived at last. <laughs> oh, God. They're all crazy, you know. Oh, my God! What do you want? So I seem to be stuck. <laughs> Mine. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> I see she's gone. What yes. did you tell her? I told her the truth. That you are mentally unbalanced. Of course, I think she was a little more mentally unbalanced than you will ever be. Still, I appreciate you not causing me any trouble, sir. Thus, I am reducing my price to an all-time low. 60 kopecks. No. Wait. Yes. No. What? 60 kopecks it is. <laughs> 60. You thief. You conniving, wretched little thief. I won't pay more than 40. 40 kopecks. Oh, yes. <laughs> Where's my profit? It cost me 20 for the towels and, well, Twenty for the men to fish me out. I might as well stand up. No, no, no. You can't fool me. No. Forty it is. Take or leave it. I know you want it. Even with the oink oink, sir. You know, you don't have to do the oink oink. But I would like it if you did. But sir, it's not complete without the oink oink. Just do the damn oink oink. <laughs> okay. You're a hard man, sir. But I like you. Forty it is. I hope not like that. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. Ten. Twenty. Thirty. That's a five, sir. Yes, it is. Thirty. And forty. Oh, sir, you dropped the coin. Yes, I did. And now it's in the water. <laughs> so you're gonna have to go get it. Sir, it's in the water. Well, hey, you're gonna drown, so why don't you go get it? <laughs> I don't like you. <laughs> okay. Now where shall I stand? Stand on the edge. That's where all the action is. It's a little dark down there. I, I can't really see. I mean... Well, that's what makes it so new, sir. Well, if I can't see, what am I paying good money for? All the action is in the last ten seconds, sir. Okay? Stand there and watch the master drown. The master of what? <coughs> Anyway. Oh, no, 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 no. It's not that type of shit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Wait, sir. I almost forgot. Popnichevsky, when I come up for the third time, I need you to yell at the top of your lungs. Popnichevsky!
standing, but I am somewhat incapacitated. Sit down, please. Thank you. Now, what can I do for you? You can help me, sir. I pray to God you can help me. No one else in the world seems to care. Calm yourself, madam. I beg of you. Please calm yourself. I'm sorry. I'm sure we can sort it all out if we approach the problem sensibly and quietly. Now, what exactly is the trouble? Well, you see, sir, it's my husband, Assistant Assessor Shunkin. He's been sick for five months. Five agonizing months. <laughs> I understand the horrors of illness and can sympathize with you, madam. Now, what is the nature of his illness? It's a nervous disorder. Everything grates on his nerves. If you so much as touch him, he'll cry out. Ah! Oh, why does he not know he knows? Ah! That's a pity, certainly. Now, but I'm afraid that I can't help you much. You don't know how I've suffered. I doctored him from night until morning, nursed him from morning until night, and all the time I had to take care of our house, our cat, our dog, our bird, our goat, our children, my sister's bird who was sick. The bird was sick? My sister! She's been having dizzy spells for a week now, and she gets dizzier every day. Extraordinary. However... And then, I had to take care of her house and her cat and her dog and her bird. And her bird bit our cat, so our cat bit her bird. And my daughter, the one with the broken arm, drowned her cat. And now my sister either wants my goat in exchange or she'll drown my cat or break my oldest daughter's other arm. <laughs> <laughs> certainly had your pack of troubles happen, <laughs> but I don't and, quite see And then when I went to collect my husband's paycheck, they deducted 24 rubles and 36 rubles <coughs> for what I asked, because they said he borrowed it from the employee's fund. That's impossible! He never would have borrowed money without consulting with me first. I would have broken his arm. Not while he was sick. 
Jane, of course. I'm not well myself. I have this racking cough. <coughs> it's a terrible thing to hear. <laughs> well, I can well understand why your husband took five months to recuperate. <laughs> what is it you want from me? 24 rubles and 36 kopecks. They won't give it to me because I'm a woman, weak and defenseless. Some of them have laughed in my face. They're <laughs> However, madam, I don't wish to be unkind, but I'm afraid you've come to the wrong place. Your petition, no matter how justified, has nothing to do with our bank. You'll have to go to the agency where your husband was employed. Don't tell me to go to another agency! I've been to five agencies already, and none of them have even listened to my petition! I think I'm about to go mad! falling out of my head in fistfuls by the fistful. Please, madam, keep your hair in its proper place. Now, listen to me carefully. This is a bank. A bank. We're in the banking business. We bank money. Money that is brought here is banked by us. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? What are you saying? I'm saying I can't help you. I'm saying you can't help me. I'm trying to. I don't think I'm making headway. <laughs> Not only do I not doubt it, I would swear to it. <laughs> Read it! What good is a doctor's certificate if you don't look at it? Read it and then I'll go. It's really not necessary. I already read it once. What's the point in reading something twice when you already read it once? You did read it carefully. Read it It's really not necessary. I know full well how your husband must be suffering. <laughs> you read it too fast then. Read it slower. I don't have to read it slower. I am a fast reader. <laughs> then you didn't absorb it. Read it again and let it sink in. I absorbed it. It sank in. I could pass a test on what's written here, but it doesn't make any difference because it has nothing to do with our bank. Now, please, madam, go. I'm sorry, Your Excellency. I, I hope I haven't caused you any pain. Oh, please, don't kiss my foot. Oh! oh Can't you get this into your balding head? If you would just realize that to come to us with this kind of claim is as strange as you're trying to get a haircut in a butcher shop. Why? Why would I get a haircut in a butcher shop? You, you can't get a haircut in a butcher shop. But John, can Are you laughing at me? <laughs> laughing? I'm lucky I'm breathing! But John, can
Me too. I had to read it twice, too. <laughs> you showed it to me outside. I read it. We all read it. Even the doorman. <laughs> you didn't read it. You just looked at it. <sighs> Don't argue, Chodkin. Read it. For God's sake, read it so we can get her out of here. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. It says your husband is sick. Now, you'll please leave. Or I have to Don't you touch me! If you touch me, I'll scream so loud they'll hear me all over the city. No one will come to a bank where they beat poor defenseless women. You'll lose all your depositors. Weak, defenseless, you are as defenseless as a charging rhinoceros. You are as weak as the king of the jungle. You are a plague, madam. That wipes out. All that crosses its path, you are a raging river that washes out bridges and stately homes. You are a wind that blows villages over mountains. You are the kind of woman who drives men like me to the condition of husbands like yours. <laughs> years old to be exact and in the ways of love I was not only unschooled I hadn't even been in the classroom I was so innocent and shy that I actually thought that since the beginning of time no woman had ever been fully unclothed <laughs> those were the days as for connubial bliss I dared not think of it and as for impregnation I chose to believe it was caused by the husband giving the wife a most ardent handshake before retiring. <laughs> and let it go at that. But my father was a wonderful man, quite liberal in his thinking. And on the occasion of my 19th birthday, he decided to introduce me to the mysteries of love. He was, however, a frugal man and decided to escort me himself to see in the matter of bargaining that I would not be taken advantage of. <laughs> Anton, come on, let's go. <laughs> oh, Father, I'm sick. Now, what's wrong with you? I don't know, give me a few minutes. Beer. That's all, that's all it is. 
pubescent fear. That was the same way when I was your age. My age, father, I was thought of you as older. How old do you think I was when I was with my first woman? You were with the woman, father. Uh, of course I was with a woman. All men who become fathers have been with a woman at one time or another. Same woman. No, not the same woman. God, <laughs> don't you ever talk about these matters with your friends? Oh, yes, but we get too excited to listen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want you becoming an old man and waiting to become a young man. Come along, we don't have all day. Yes, Father. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, uh, we have to hurry. We have exactly an hour and ten minutes before we have to be home. I told your mother we'd be home by nine. You told mother where we were going? Of course not. I think I'm so insensitive. I told her we were going for a nice, long, brisk walk to get to the fresh air. But won't you become suspicious when I come home all grown up? <laughs> Boy! <laughs> she must learn. It doesn't show. Uh, you don't get spots like measles. You may possibly have a small smile on your face. <laughs> but that's all. <laughs> <laughs> Be a man! It doesn't hurt that much! Yes, Papa, for a man. Are you sure you want to go through with this? I don't know, Father. I, I don't think we're going to find any women of high moral character around here. You missed the point. You're not looking for women of high moral character. There are too many damn one of them as there is. <laughs> That's why so many high world men like myself, and no, just myself, have to come down to places like this. Now, are you going to go in there and become a man, or am I going to have to punish you? Ooh. If I like it, Father, can we come back? <laughs> no! I didn't come down here with the good intention of leaving you here. I was talking to the little father. Now, if you'd rather not go through with it, I will take, take you. Take Wait till I ask the question, okay? <laughs> if you'd rather not go through with it, I will take you home. Take me home. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes, you can go in the tub and play with your boats until you're ready. <laughs> you can get angry with me, Father. No, no. Will you be disappointed? No. Will you be proud of me, Father? No. <laughs> <laughs> Good boy, yes. Hey, wait, 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 steady, boy. Oh my god. <laughs> She looks like the principal to me. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll go over and attend your tuition. Stop twiddling your with your hat. This isn't hat twiddling business. And get it down from on there. Put it on your head. Come that. <laughs> like to discuss with you a matter of some delicacy. 30 rubles. So much for the delicacy, okay. <laughs> 30 rubles, you say? Well, speaking for myself, I would... I'd have to say 30 rubles was quite fair, but it's not for me. It's for my young, inexperienced son. That's him with the knees buckling, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, I know that, but doesn't that seem a little high for a boy of 19? Would you consider a 15? For 15 rubles, I'd read Peter Rabbit. Sir, there's a new regentship due in here tonight, and I have to go put on my blonde wig. Wait, wait, wait. 
There is an extenuating circumstance. It's the boy's birthday. I thought I'd get him a nice gift. How about an umbrella? <laughs> <laughs> Chili. <laughs> son, son, son. Do me a favor. Run around, jump up and down, do something. <laughs> okay, just stand there. Stand there. I'll deal with you later. <laughs> now look here. In my day 30 years ago. I shared the pleasures of the most delightful woman on the street. Ilka, the milkmaid, she was called. And she cost me a mere 10 rubles. Well, she's still here. Ew. Oh, Ilka! <laughs> oh, my God! I'm sure there's a moral there somewhere. I just don't see it yet, and I don't care. <laughs> 20 rubles. There. Now, where shall he go? Two flights out, second door on the left. Do you hear that, son? There's <laughs> <laughs> one thing I ask. Gentleness. Of course, sir. Please be gentle with my son. <laughs> <laughs> Oh God, a tear. What? Oh, what a thing to cry over. Well, anyway, uh, settled. Oh yes, there's one more thing I ask. When you are done with tonight's festivities, I would like it if you would merely say, happy birthday from Papa. Happy birthday from Papa. Would you like any candles, sir? No, 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 that's not necessary. Just happy birthday from Papa. Well, may I say, sir, it's men like you that make me proud to serve in my profession. She would have made a lovely nurse. And Tasha. Yes, father. School's in. <laughs> Settled for 20 rubles. Two flags off, second door on the left, you know. Yay. <laughs> oh, oh, father. Yes. Should I say anything to her? Like what? Well, like hello, Father. Yes, yes, hello would be nice. Goodbye would be good too. The things you ask. Go get her. <laughs> oh, Father, you know, when I come down those stairs, I, I won't be your little Aunt Tasha anymore. I'll be. And don't the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm proud that you see it that way. But you'll always be my little girl. <laughs> oh, I said you promise you stop calling me a girl. Call as soon as you stop acting, you're like, well, oh my god! Oh, I hate you! <laughs> I hope that portrait of my father came out with some affection. 
I loved him very much. And yet with him, as with all the other characters I've shared with you tonight, I have a sense of betrayal. When I put down my pen at the end of a day's work, I cannot help but feel that I have robbed my friends of their life fluid. But before I go, what was it we were talking about earlier? Oh, yes. I was about to say what it was as a child I most wanted to do with my life. Well then. Funny. For the life of me, I can't remember. But as I stand here with a feeling of great peace and contentment, I suspect in some measure I must be doing it. Thank you for this visit. If ever you pass this way again, Please drop in. Oh, wait. There's an alternate ending. <laughs> if ever you pass this way again, I hope you inherit five million rubles. <laughs>